Mr. President, I rise today to speak about uh, an issue of vital importance involving the United States attorneys. Each of the 93 U.S. attorneys serves as the chief federal law enforcement officer within his or her jurisdiction. U.S. attorneys prosecute the full spectrum of criminal cases brought on behalf of the United States, from hate crimes to human trafficking to gang violence to cybercrime to narcotics to financial fraud to terrorism. The list is long, and the violations of the law that are alleged are serious. The position of the United States attorney is nearly as old as the nation itself. In fact, the position has existed since the first Congress. President George Washington signed into law the law that created these attorneys in the Judiciary Act of 1789. Given the critical role that these U.S. attorneys play in bringing justice to those who violate federal criminal laws, it is hard to imagine that any member of this body would obstruct efforts to confirm these law enforcement officials. Doing so could threaten public safety and puts at risk millions of American security. It's also a stark departure from what has happened before. The last time the Senate required a roll call vote on a U.S. attorney nominee was 1975. Forty-six years have passed without the request for a roll call vote on a U.S. attorney. For decades, the Senate has confirmed U.S. attorneys by voice vote or unanimous consent after they have been considered in the Judiciary Committee. Listen to this, Mr. President. During the Trump administration, 85 of President Trump's U.S. attorney nominees moved through the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. Of those 85, the Senate confirmed every single Trump nominee by unanimous consent without even requesting a record vote. I might add, just for the record, I believe one nominee was held for one week so that the question can be answered about his background. That's the only thing that I can recall where they even slowed down the process during the Trump administration. And certainly it was within our power as Democrats to stop and require a vote, but we didn't. Yet now there is a Republican objection to holding a voice vote on five U.S. attorney nominees. Greg Harris for the Central District of Illinois, Claire Connors for Hawaii, Zachary Cunha for Rhode Island, Nicholas Carest for Vermont, Philip Selinger for New Jersey, Several of these nominees have been held up for weeks, weeks, by this objection. Why, you ask, is there an objection to these five nominees? There must be something wrong with their records. Well, let's take a look. Greg Harris, personal friend of mine. I practiced law with him in Springfield, Illinois. He spent nearly three decades as assistant U.S. attorney in the Central, Central District of Illinois. That includes my hometown. He's tried over 50 cases to verdict and held a number of leadership positions in the U.S. Attorney's Office. He serves on the Central Illinois Human Trafficking Task Force and the Bankruptcy War Fraud Working Group. His nomination is historic. He'll be the first African-American U.S. Attorney in the district, the Central District of Illinois, which of course is located in Mr. Lincoln's hometown of Springfield. The first. Claire Connors, currently the Attorney General of Hawaii. Ms. Connors previously served as criminal prosecutor in the Justice Department's Tax Division, Special Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, and for nearly seven years an Assistant U.S. Attorney in Hawaii. Zachary Cunha, currently an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the District of Rhode Island in the same office he will lead upon confirmation. He's worked there for eight years following time as an assistant U.S. attorney in both the Eastern District of New York and the District of Massachusetts. Nicholas Carest, also an assistant U.S. attorney, served in the role of dis in the District of Vermont since 2010, following time in private legal practice in Maine and Massachusetts and a clerkship in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Philip Selinger has had long and distinguished legal career in New Jersey. He began his legal career as a law clerk for Judge Ann Thompson of District of New Jersey before joining the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. For the past two decades, Mr. Selinger has been a litigator at a prominent law firm, even served as the firm's co-chair of global litigation. Listen to these biographies. 
all five of these nominees are eminently qualified to hold the office of U.S. Attorney, to prosecute crimes and bring civil actions on behalf of the government, and to help safeguard our communities across America. There is one thing that all of these U.S. Attorney nominees have in common, though. They are all from states with two Democratic senators. That seems to be the only thing that they might have in common. The objections to these nominees are not that they aren't qualified or that the job is not important. The objection seems to be that they're from states with two Democratic senators. So when it comes to critical issues we expect in the Department of Justice to be taken care of by U.S. attorneys, issues involving terrorism, human trafficking, narcotics, public corruption, gun violence, the safety of our communities, is the fact that they happen to hail from states with two Democratic senators enough to disqualify them or to leave these positions vacant? It's time to end the Republican delay and get these well-qualified prosecutors confirmed and on the job. We never once, during the Trump administration's four years, held up a U.S. attorney when it came to a voice vote, a unanimous voice vote, to give them the opportunity to serve this country. It is unthinkable that we're going to do these, this to these fine men and women today. And so today I'll ask unanimous consent for a vote on these nominees. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate consider the following nomination. Calendar numbers 534, 35, 535, 536, 581, and 582. That the nominations be confirmed, the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. That no further motions be in order, the nominations that any related statements be printed in the record, that the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action. Is there objection? Mr. President. Senator from Arkansas. I reserve the right to object. Mr. President, the Senate is a special institution. It's a unique institution. James Madison said the Senate was the only truly innovative part of our Constitution. It remains the case today that our Senate is the only upper chamber in a Western Parliament that has more power under our Constitution than does the lower chamber. That is in part because of the design of the Senate in our Constitution, because of our Senate rules, of our traditions, of our customs. We've heard a lot about courtesy and collegiality and respect. Those are very important customs around here, but it has to be a two-way street. Earlier this year, in the Judiciary Committee, during the markup for Vanita Gupta to be Associate Attorney General, I was speaking, as is my right, under the Judiciary Committee rules. There's at least one other Republican senator who was preparing to speak. There may have been more. The senator from Illinois, in his role as chairman of the committee, cut off my remarks and forced through the vote on Vanita Gupta, all so he could save one week to get her confirmed, just one week. I said at the time, I said right here at this desk nine months ago, that when our rules and our traditions are so flagrantly breached, there has to be some kind of consequence. And I outlined exactly what that consequence would be at the time, that I would not expedite consideration, as the Senator from Illinois rightly observes is the custom here, for any U.S. Attorney nominee from a state represented by a Democrat on the Judiciary Committee. Because if there are not consequences when rules and traditions are breached in this institution, we will soon not have rules and traditions. Now, I also said that if the senator from Illinois would simply express regret for what happened that day and pledge that it wouldn't happen again, I would be happy to let all of these nominees move forward. We have communicated this to the senator from Illinois and his staff on multiple occasions. I reiterate it today. I would be happy to confirm these nominees in the following few minutes if the senator from Illinois would simply express regret for what happened in the hearing that day and commit that it won't happen again, which I say again is simply committing that we follow our own rules. If we hear that from the senator from Illinois, we'll have five new U.S. attorneys. And I see the senators from Rhode Island and Hawaii and New Jersey here. As the senator from Illinois says, I have no objection to moving forward with any of these particular 
nominees, all these states can have their U.S. attorneys this afternoon. But if not, I'll have to continue to insist that we not expedite these nominations. So, Mr. President, I object. Objection is heard. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, I've been trying to understand the Republican objection to these well-qualified U.S. attorney nominees, and the senator from Arkansas has made it clear. It has nothing to do with them. It's about me. He obviously doesn't approve of what happened one day in the committee, and the price to be paid is not by me, but by the U.S. attorneys, well-qualified, who have important jobs to fill. One member of the Republican caucus is upset with the fact that back in March, this happened in March, the Judiciary Committee moved to vote on the nomination of Vanita Gupta to be Associate Attorney General when Republican members of the committee had not finished speaking in her nomination. He correctly remembers that he was speaking at approximately 10 minutes to 12. When I interrupted him, took a roll call vote, and then went back to him if he wished to speak again. I'll be the first to acknowledge that I move forward with a vote on Ms. Gupta's nomination over the objections of committee Republicans. But put simply, the Republicans forced my hand that day. The Senator from Arkansas talks about courtesy in this body. I will tell him I think that it should be a hallmark of what we all do at all times. I am fortunate, truly blessed in my mind, to have as the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee a real friend in Chuck Grassley, the Republican Senator of Iowa. I asked him that day what was going on. I had informed the committee in writing that we would proceed with a vote on Ms. Gupta that day. I then allowed committee Republicans to speak for 94 minutes on Ms. Gupta's nomination, even though much of what was said was repetitive, some false, and some really unwarranted. I was in fact to prepare allowed committee Republicans to speak for as long as they wish. I turned to Senator Grassley and said, what's the plan here? And he said, well, Senator Tillis may return and speak. And we just have these members speaking. I'd received assurances that the Republicans would not use an obscure Senate rule, the two-hour rule, to cut off the markup before we voted on Ms. Gupta's nomination. But at 11.55 a.m., I was surprised, as was Senator Grassley, to be informed that despite their earlier assurances, a Republican senator had in fact um, invoked the two-hour rule in an effort to prevent Ms. Gupta's nomination from being considered that day and to close down the markup in the committee. My hand was forced by this action. It was a surprise move, tactical move, surely within the rules for them to, to make, but I did exactly what previous Republican chairs of the Judiciary Committee did in similar situations. I ended the debate and called for the vote on the nomination. Now, if you're listening to this and wondering what these arcane committee procedures have to do with U.S. attorney nominations, you're not alone. The senator is pleading that we should stand by the traditions of the Senate. In the traditions of the Senate, these U.S. attorney nominees would go through by unanimous consent. That's a tradition of the Senate as well. The simple answer is what happened with the markup debate more than eight months ago has nothing to do with these five fine individuals or with any other U.S. attorney nominee who may come before the Senate. If the senator from Arkansas wants me to public ex publicly express my regret for this occurrence, I express that regret. But I want to make it clear. I relied on my friend, Senator Grassley. We were both surprised to know that someone had invoked the two-hour rule. Caught by surprise, I did what other Republican chairs of the committee have done. I don't believe we should play politics with critical law enforcement nominations. They are putting our communities at risk and politicizing law enforcement in a way that threatens public safety. If we're going to truly stand up for law and order, let these men and women go to work across America representing the Department of Justice. Senator from Arkansas. Um, I'd like to address the chair a question of the senator from Illinois. I appreciate those comments. I would observe that since that day, uh, we have not had a similar circumstance in which any Republican wishing to speak that speak was cut off in a markup. Um, can we simply have a commitment that that will not happen again in the future, as it hasn't happened in the last nine months? Mr. President, yeah, Senator from responding Illinois. through the chair, as long as there is openness and honesty about what is happening in procedure, I will assure you I'll do everything I can to extend that courtesy uh, forward. That particular day, 
you may or may not be aware of the fact that while you were speaking, we learned, Cinder Grassley and I both learned, that someone had raised the two-hour rule. Uh, and it came as a surprise to both of us. When we're open and honest about what we're trying to achieve in the committee, there's no reason why we can't abide by basic courtesy in the tradition of the Senate. Mr. Sure. President, I appreciate the remarks from the Senator for Illinois. I will invite him to uh, make his unanimous consent request again. I do not intend to object further. And a voice vote is fine with me. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the Senate consider the following nominations on block. Calendars numbers 534, 535, 536, 581, 582. That the Senate vote on the nominations on block without intervening action or debate. The motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. That any statements related to the nominations be printed in the record. That the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action. Is there an objection? Without objection. Without objection.